Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to PerfWeb 78. Oops, let me cut this volume down. I apologize for that. PerfWeb 78, day two. Uh, this is also uh, John Ingram's Knowledge Nuggets, episode number 17. And I want to welcome everybody here. Very quickly, uh, I'm not going to spend much time in the opening remarks. You know how to get a hold of us. You know about our podcast. You know about our app. You can do all of that, contact a Perfusion Education, whatever your favorite, look for PerfWeb on whatever your favorite uh, uh, podcast streaming platform is. And then of course we have our uh, app, of which it's the uh, Perfusion and Clinical Care app. It's great, uh, great for ECMO specialists in the ICU. It's also great uh, if you're in the operating room, get all your information that you need for your case done very quickly. It's got some really cool features to it, uh, recent updates, and uh, you know, I'd like you to, to there, look, you got a QR code, just do the QR code, buy it, and uh, you know, I say it all the time jokingly, we just need to sell a million of them, it's two ninety nine each, and I'm going to be done. Okay, you give it, if you want to get rid of me, Help me sell a million of these things. Um, and I think that's it. We got John ready to go with his uh, episode on uh, today is going to be on, it's on renal, right? Urine output. Where's John? I don't see him. There's John. Hey, John. Hey, um, Joe. How's how it going? How come I don't yeah, see him over here? Magic. Magic. We're going to do the enormous task yeah. of trying to answer the question. Hey, hold on, John. We can't, we can't, okay. John, we can't hear you. So hold on a second. Oh, okay. we, we're having technical difficulties. Let's see if I'm okay. Yeah, I guess I'm mm -hmm. good. Yeah, hold on one second. I think we're getting it figured out. Yeah, there you go. Hey. Well, no, I couldn't hear. I can't hear him either. Okay, I can't. I'm a little hard of hearing, okay? Can you help me out? All right, welcome, John. There you go. Okay, now I think we're set. I got all my opening remarks done in less than two minutes, and now we're uh, we're live and we're going forward with uh, knowledge nuggets, episode number seventeen, and our topic today is urine output on CPB. When is enough enough? And I've got a few comments to make. Uh, if you want to just start with a little brief introduction, because I've got some comments to make before you get started with your slides. Well, you know, um, this is a topic that is very rarely covered in the literature. It's always covered in a roundabout way with regard to do whatever we do. Does it cause AKI? Do we have acute a kidney injury after bypass? And the eternal question of how much urine is actually the right amount of urine uh, although we've been taught to have a very simple answer to that one, I think most people use one cc per kilogram per hour, uh, is basically just something somebody came up with one day and it stuck and it's been around for at least 50 years that I know of. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to look at a lot closer today and see if what we can make sense of and if there's any possible way to really answer that or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, there's driving forces to urine output, right? I mean, and uh, a lot of that is, is flow pressure dynamics, of course. You can have, um, I'm sure, ionic, you know, you have uh, excessive sodium. Your kidneys want to get rid of that. There, I mean, there's a lot of things that the kidney is just such an incredibly complex organ. Um, and I think that we have uh, uh, really... Uh, uh, you know, for given how high a rate AKI is in, in cardiac surgery, um, which ranges anywhere from, what, 8 to 30%, depending on the complexity of the case. And, you know, there's a lot of things about it, you know, that, that the number's pretty, pretty, broad, pretty wide, you know. Um, but valves seem to be a lot worse. Very long pump runs seem to be a lot worse. Um, what are the what are the and then you have the inflammatory process but my my lecture tomorrow is going to sort of dovetail with yours today because i'm going to be talking about data that suggests urine output is reduced by the use of z buff uh during pump and i think there's another aspect to this um is we have so many acronyms. It's, it is truly alphabet soup with ultrafiltration and scuff 
and Cuff and Z-Buff and, you know, all of these different terms, Muff, to describe what it is we're doing. And I think that a lot of people use these terms somewhat interchangeably and in incorrectly to what it is they're trying to describe or what the reader is understanding as being described at the time. It's a very, com it's a very interesting, it's so simple, but it is, it's the ultimate dichotomy of it's so simple, but it is incredibly complicated. Yeah, um, I am going, I broke this lecture down into three parts. Number one, we're going to do a fairly uh, quick review of renal anatomy and physiology. Then we're going to do a quick review of AKI and all the causative factors. And then we're going to look at the research that talks about what can we conclude from urine on bypass? What can we uh, learn from it? What are, we, what are we seeing when we see urine on bypass? Do we know what we're seeing? And can we somewhere along the line figure out what urine output is good and what urine output is bad? I don't know if these questions have ever been completely answered. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done a lot of cases where our urine output on bypass was zero. And mm -hmm. the patients did just fine, didn't have any any uh any lasting effect of any pro no no problem immediately post-operatively no aki no long-term renal dysfunction no nothing just just went on to be normal um and then i've had other cases where you know just anecdotally speaking where i had you know great urine on bypass and the patient next thing you know is on dialysis long term um, i'm actually going to cover that i'm going to cover that and why why that is and if you have excessive urine on bypass that can be a very bad sign actually interesting very interesting okay let me let me turn this over to you knowledge nuggets right, episode 17. let me see if i can do something with my little thing here okay your new computer so, uh, did you get a mac I got another ThinkPad, my Did, friend, just for video. You got Should another ThinkPad? I'm a confused enough. You want to confuse me with a Mac? <laughs> Ma man, a Mac is so is so much easier to use. Yeah, you maybe I will. This is sort of a this is sort of a temporary fix. Let's see how it goes. I guess. But, okay. Um, all right. I know you have a, a, an engagement in about an hour, right, Joe? So we'll be done by then. Okay. Uh, good. But, but knowledge nuggets, as Joe mentioned, uh, this is episode 17, March 16th. 2022. Uh, my name is John Ingram. I have no disclosures on this or any other topic. And we call this Knowledge Nuggets because we have a motto that says, spend a little time and expand your mind. And why do we come up with that motto? Because we want to pick a noteworthy topic each session. Each one of these Knowledge Nugget sessions want to find something that is hopefully very relevant to your practice and something that you can take home, a nugget of information that you can take home with you. You can screenshot us a screen or two. When you see this gold nugget up in the right hand corner of the screen, you'll know that that is a take home slide. Take home with you to take it to work tomorrow. Maybe you'll uh, be able to use it. So our format is a highly impactful segment, usually about 12 to 15 minutes. Today will be probably about a little longer than that, followed by a two to three minute surprise topic that's always interesting. Could be absolutely anything. Doesn't have to be perfusion related. Two to three minutes. Then we have a panel discussion with questions from the audience. And then if you guys want to reach out to me, please contact me at john.ingram at perfweb.us for questions and comments. Today's topic, urine on carded pulmonary bypass. When is enough enough? So I'm going to do a quick review. It's going to be in three parts. Like I said, part one, we need to understand and remind ourselves about renal anatomy and physiology, Joe. And this is um, stealing from one of my lectures about two and a half, three years ago when I started with you a pretty uh, detailed uh, lecture about uh, anatomy and physiology, but I'm going to slim it down today. So you look at a cross section of the kidney and you see the support structures. Uh, go ahead, David, you can go through these a little bit. So you start off with the renal pelvis, which is really just the skeleton and support structure of the kidney. And then you have your renal artery and renal veins blading blood in and out as long as, as well as the ureter, which is how you uh, drain your, your waste, your urine down to your bladder. And then of course you have the, um, uh, arterial veins divide up into smaller and smaller veins uh, in the in the medulla, and, and eventually it leads you to um, and the medulla is full of the functional unit of the kidney known as the nephron. So that's just the sequence of the flow pattern. 
and then of course it goes back to the, the renal veins. And looking at it here, you basically want to look at, uh, go ahead, go back. That was fine. That, that slide, go ahead, Dave. Next slide. Yeah, so you're looking here uh, a little closer at the nephron. You have the afferent uh, arteriole, which leads blood into the glomerulus. Then once in the glomerulus, the blood does a tremendous dump of uh, plasma that goes into the um, tubules. And then the blood then exits the, uh, the glomerulus and it exits out the efferent arteriole. And the reason I show this is after it leaves the efferent arteriole is then when it goes through the tubules, but then it also still has to perfuse the tissues of the lungs. So the blood has to do all the work of the uh, function of, of the nephron, and then it's going to perfuse the tissues, and then it's going to end up as venous blood. And we're going to talk about why that's important, because it's one straight perfusion system that actually does the function of tissue perfusion as well as function of the nephron. So there's a tremendous desaturation of the blood as it goes through the kidney doing all these functions. So you have three steps of the nephron. You have filtration, reabsorption, secretion. Filtration starts off where the blood dumps a tremendous amount of plasma water, not proteins and not cellular components, by the way, but everything else will go into the uh, glomerulus and then begin to work its way down the tubules where you'll have reabsorption and secretion. And at the end of all that, you're going to have your urine excretion there coming out at the bottom. So in filtration, you have a huge percentage of plasma water that comes through the blood, basically just dumped indiscriminately into the glomerulus. The exception is no protein and no, and no cellular components. In reabsorption, now that the plasma is traversing down the uh, tubules, a, a huge amount of these solutes are then reabsorbed back into the bloodstream and, uh, and, 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 and the waste is what's retained in the tubules. Everything else is returned back into the bloodstream. And then in secretion, you have another aspect of additional waste being removed from the blood. And then finally, it's going to be excreted down to the uh, tubules for the, to the bladder. So filtration is driven by starling forces. You have 180 liters a day of filtrate of plasma water that enters the tubules. It's essentially plasma, except it has no cells or large proteins, as I said. Now, 98% of, of this volume will be reabsorbed during reabsorption, leaving only concentrated waste to be excreted. And reabsorption is the process by which useful solutes like glucose, amino acids, ions, and so on, and water are removed from the filtrate and transported back into the blood. So all of this stuff is dumped in, and then the kidney does this enormous amount of work to retrieve back. 99% has to be reabsorbed back into the blood because all of that, uh, only 1% of that is basically waste. And then in secretion, it's an additional step where removal of harmful substances from the blood are also put into filtrate, things like ions, uh, excess potassium and hydrogen uh, as if in acidosis, ammonia ions, which are waste, creatinine and urea, which is also waste, some hormones, and of course, a lot of drugs that are excreted through the kidney are basically taken care of during the secretion step. So I go through this, and I'm going to explain to you real quickly why, but how much urine is formed does depend largely, amount, largely on the amount of blood flow, but it is far from the only factor. Now, the kidneys, go ahead, the kidneys require 20% of the cardiac output at rest. By the way, this is a golden nugget slide for people who want to understand how demanding of the blood supply the kidneys are. They take a full 20% of our cardiac output, that one organ alone. Now the question is, why do the kidneys require so much blood supply, 20% of the cardiac out output? And the answer is because they're in a constant state of production of an enormous amount of ATP that is necessary for that reabsorption phase that I was just talking about, the phase that requires 180 liters per day to be reabsorbed back in through the nephrons in a 24-hour period of the average adult. 
So the kidneys filter 180 liters a day, 179 liters is reabsorbed. 99% of the sodium is reabsorbed and is powered by the sodium potassium ATPase pump. This requires energy. It requires uh, one ATP to pump three sodium ion, ions out of and two potassium ions back into the cell. A full ATP. Glycolysis produces only two molecules of ATP, and mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation generates 34 mole molecules of ATP. So to retrieve 99% of the sodium, 1.7 times 10 to the 24th power, what is that? I guess 24 zeros past the decimal point? Molecules of ATP per day is required to reabsorb 179 liters a day. Significant oxygen delivery is, is, is required to produce the ATP for this mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation that's, that's taking place here. So now ATP must be produced not only for reabsorption of sodium, but for glucose, amino acids, and that many other ions also have to be absorbed. And these are pumped against a gradient. This is why it requires so much ATP and energy to do that. Now, the kidney is a unique organ for two reasons. Due to the way the kidney functions, it is the only organ in which we cannot provide a luxurious oxygen supply. We cannot overperfuse the kidney, and that is the only organ that, that is true of. Blood flow to the renal parenchyma is inhomogeneous. Regional, there's regional variation in the tissue oxygenation. We're going to look at that real briefly here. Now, it's unique for reasons. One, due to the way the kidney functions, it is the only organ to which we cannot provide a luxurious oxygen supply, meaning we cannot overfuse. Because if you look there, it says oxygen delivery, which is our blood supply, when you increase it, it translates to uh, all of that increased blood having to go through a filtration and an increase in the glomerular filtration rate, GFR. You have to you have to do increased reabsorption, you have to do increased secretion, and all that is an increased consumption of ATP. And the end result is that as you increase the blood supply, you have an increased oxygen demand to replace and to manufacture that ATP. So in other words, imagine a package sorting plant down at FedEx or UPS, and all these boxes are your hemoglobin, your blood supply coming into this packaging plant. Okay, next slide, David. And as you see, if you see all of these hemoglobin, these boxes, you can pour in as much as you want. But if you look over to there to the left, those little sorter guys over there have to work that much harder. That is the nephron. It is having to work that much harder to sort that much more blood supply. So as you increase the blood supply, the energy and oxygen consumed goes right up with it. Therefore, you cannot overperfuse the kidney. Right. So just, just to be clear, John, and, and for clarification purposes, increased blood flow is related to increased GFR because you have more blood flow going through there, which requires more energy for, the, for all of the process of the kidney. But that increased workload is offset by the increase in DO2 from the increase in blood flow. So it just works in like a circle, right? Yeah, I mean, you're increasing your delivery of oxygen, which is what I was showing there with all the boxes being oxygen molecules or hemoglobin with oxygen molecules. But then the nephron, you can't bypass the nephron. It all has to go right. through. And as blood goes through the renal, uh, those GFR, the glomerulus and the tubules, it all has to be reabsorbed, reabsorption, secretion, all has to take place with all that blood. Well, that has to be, uh, has to demand production of ATP, which is, which is energy. And right. so... Uh, you know, it's not like the lung where you have two uh, separate blood supplies. One, you know, the bronchial circulation to perfuse the tissues of the lung and the pulmonary circulation to do the function of the right. lung with the alveolus. This is in series. They all go through one long path. Right. I was so, just trying to it, clarify, too, that you, you that under perfusing the kidney doesn't decrease its it decreases its workload, but you create your own setup. So l higher flow isn't bad. Lower flow is bad. Correct. You right, agree with that? You have, you, yes, because you have the 
minimum amount of oxygen that must be supplied to the parenchyma and the and the and the you know all the cells that make up the kidney. The, the, all, every cell needs oxygen, right? I mean, whether it's a structural cell, a tissue cell, a, a, a vascular cell, everything needs oxygen. So you can't just cut it off. It has to be a minimum. And, and it's already working on a very low PO2, which I know we've talked about this before. We're going to look at that uh, uh, briefly. In fact, it's very easy to underperfuse the kidneys and, and not possible to overperfuse it. But um, when we look at... Um, why you can't um, overperfuse the, the, the kidney. It's verified, of course, through research. I want to put a couple up here. Increased renal blood flow does increase oxygen supply, as you just said, Joe, but also increases oxygen demand due to reabsorption of the sodium primarily, which is the major determinant of renal oxygen consumption. Increased oxygen delivery by renal blood flow is directly counteracted by that increased oxygen consumption. And then maneuvers that increase the, the GFR, glomerular filtration rate, and thus then the tubular sodium load also increase oxygen consumption. If anybody wants to read on that, those are the articles real small there at the bottom of the screen. You can email me or you can snapshot that slide. Okay. Now, uh, blood flow to the renal parenchyma, the tissue and the support structures of the kidney is inhomogeneous. Ren there's regional variation in tissue oxygenation. So this is where the rubber kind of hits the road, Joe, with this. The high renal blood flow is directed to the cortex to optimize filtration and reabsorption. Okay, that's where you have uh, the uh, glomerulus in the beginning of the tubules, but a large percentage of tub tubules goes down into the medulla. Well, at this first part, the PO2 comes in is only 50 millimeters in the cortex. Then, as the uh, the renal tissues are nourished by that efferent glomerular artery. That's the artery that then leaves the glomerulus uh, after it's gone through the gone through the glomerulus. The artery then exits the glomerulus, and then it carries now poorly oxygenated blood because it's done some work already. And this leads to borderline renal tissue hypoxia, which is the state in which our kidneys remain in very borderline uh, hypoxic. The effect is particularly pronounced down in the renal medulla where a lot of the uh, reabsorption occurs, where PO2 levels are ranged between 10 and 25, and that is the normal range of the PO2 way down in the medulla for a healthy kidney. Now, here's a take-home message uh, about, about this, so you guys can uh, snapshot this when I get to the bottom of the final listing. Increased O2 delivery by renal blood flow is directly counteracted by increased oxygen consumption, the low medullary perfusion and high oxygen consumption of the ascending limbs result in poorly oxygenated medulla, the, the heavy part of the kidney. With a normal PO2 of 10 to 25, the medulla exists on the border of hypoxia even under normal conditions. No oxygen availability occurs during cardiac surgery, which is a common cause of ischemic acute kidney injury. Now, I just want to go over acute kidney injury. You can't talk about urine output with, on any research paper you pull up and it wants to tell you all about acute kidney injury. So we're just going to do a quick review of this part. Now we're going to get to the urine production. So just, uh, again, acute kidney injury uh, they, they has three types that, that uh, uh, categories where acute in kidney injury can occur. One is pre-renal, one is renal, and one is post-renal. So you can have pre-renal reduced perfusion, renal intrinsic renal insult in the kidney, and then after um, the kidney, it's obstructive neuropathy. But I really want to look at the, uh, the fact that you also have hemodynamic insults, which is perfusion with ischemia and reperfusion. You have inflammatory insults, as you had said earlier, Joe, with inflammatory activators, neurohormonal activators. You can have oxidative stress, which, by the way, didn't we cover that last week under um, oxygen-free radicals? And then, of course, you can have any toxic agents. A lot of pharmaceuticals and all types of things can be toxic to the kidney, causing uh, tissue damage there. So now what I really wanted to focus on, though, was the risk factors of acute kidney injury. We have preoperative things that occur that cause AKI, perioperative, and of course, postoperative. So look at all these. This is just what can occur and often does occur to a lot of these 
in our preoperative phase. Go to the next slide, David, and I'll show you. Look at all these things, guys. These are how, how many of our patients are anemic or NPO the night before? All of them. How many of them are advanced age, have left main disease, diabetes, hypertension? Hypertension. How many of them have COPD or peripheral vascular disease or have had a stroke? They've all had contrast media because they've all come from the cath lab, and almost all of them have LV dysfunction. That's why we're part of the reason why we're seeing them. And then in addition to that, you also have people that are on a lot of meds for blood pressure, like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, which, ARBs, which are basically uh, angiotensin blockers. And of course, people are on NSAIDs all the time. That's just the preoperative ones. We see these all the time. These are all increased risk factors for AKI. Now let's look at the perioperative ones. Okay, now go to the next slide also, David, and you'll see what I've highlighted. Now, how many of our patients have this? Surgery within 24 hours of receiving contrast. Most of them have been to the cath lab the day before. How many valves or cabbages combinations do we do? Emergency operations, reoperations. Almost everybody uses a non-pulsatile cardiopulmonary bypass system. Low pro flow perfusion may occur, turning the flow down during the case for the surgeon. Balloon pumps, hypothermic cardiopulmonary bypass, bypass longer than 100 minutes. How many of our patients are anemic and get hemodiluted? Well, almost all of them get hemodiluted on, on perfusion. How many of them are on alpha vasoconstrictors? As we've talked about phenylephrine, people use that almost universally here on pump in the United States. How many of them might have any reason to have venous congestion? for one reason or the other, poor venous return on bypass. Now let's, let's look at the post-operative ones. Go ahead again, David, and you'll see the highlight. Post-operative phase in the ICU, they could have a, a, a low cardiac output state because they're struggling in the ICU. Something goes downhill a little bit overnight. Hypovolemic, hypotension, drop their blood pressure. They have to be on vasopressors. I mean, this is almost all of our patients experience all of these, right, Joe, 90%. 90 uh, then you're gonna have systemic inflammation, of course, because of the bypass pump. And there are people on a lot of medications, you know, antibiotics and ACE inhibitors. If they become hemodynamic and unstable overnight or the next three days post bypass, this is also a risk factor for AKI. So the reason I bring all this up, you can go ahead to the next slide, David, is that when you try to understand why urine output on bypass by itself is causing AKI, you would have to do a study, I don't know, in the hundreds of thousands of patients to eliminate all of these risk factors that most of our patients have and just isolate it to say, well, we didn't have enough urine output on pump to the exclusion of all those other risk factors. This is why the person had uh, AKI. So go ahead. I'm going to do a quick review of the anatomy and physiology uh, conclusions, uh, which we already did this slide, but, but uh, I just want to remind you guys because you have increased oxygen delivery by renal blood flow is directly counteracted by oxygen consumption. You have low medullary perfusion, high oxygen consumption, and poorly oxygenated medulla. With a normal PO2 of 10 to 25, the medulla exists on the border, on the border of hypoxia under normal conditions. And then, of course, we mentioned that low oxygen availability occurs during cardiac surgery, which is a common cause also of ischemic acute injury. Is there one more? No. Okay, now we're going to get to the meat of the matter here, Joe. I needed to do all that, so this makes some sense. Uh, our, our last part of the lecture, urine output on bypass. What does the research indicate? Now, I have three very good papers here, Joe. And Joe, let me tell you, it's not easy to find a paper that really does a good job on isolating urine output and kind of making it a conclusion towards anything because mm -hmm. of what I just explained of how many other things are going on. But there's a, a doctor named Lucas Lenemir and a bunch of colleagues that with there, but they're all MD PhDs on his papers. He did two papers that I'm going to cite by him. Then I'm going to do a third paper on this and then we'll be wrapped up. But this one is the effects of cardiopulmonary bypass on renal perfusion, filtration, and oxygenation of patients undergoing Cardiac Surgery was published in Anesthesiology Journal 2017. And what they did now, it's a small study, 18 patients, but let's go through because you're going to see how powerful what these gentlemen did. 18 patients with normal preoperative serum creatinine underwent cardiac surgery. They were normal thermic cardiopulmonary bypass, so they took away the uh, hypothermia aspect of it. Systemic and renal hemodynamic variables were measured by pulmonary artery, 
catheter sampling and renal vein catheters before, during, and after cardiopulmonary bypass. They had to get consent from the patients to be allowed to add these catheters, especially in the renal vein. Arterial and renal vein blood samples were taken for measurements of renal oxygen delivery and consumption. Renal oxygenation was estimated from the renal oxygen extraction. Urinary N acetyl B E glata glucosaminase, which is also known as NAG, that is the enzyme that is released whenever there is renal damage. Very good indicator enzyme. There's others. It was measured before, during, and after bypass as well. So it's pretty good uh, uh, structured study here. So what were their uh, results? Well, number one, the results were that cardiopulmonary bypass induced a renal vasoconstriction and a redistribution of blood flow away from the kidneys. kidneys. This is not fully understood, but this is what they proved occurs. When in combination with hemodilution, which decreased renal oxygen delivery by 20%. So you were talking about, Joe, that we deliver more oxygen, but they implicate hemodilution as, a, as us get, taking a, a hit on delivering our oxygen because you have a lower hematocrit. And as you know, from the delivery of oxygen equation, hemoglobin is a big factor in our delivery of oxygen. While glomerular filtration rate and renal oxygen consumption were unchanged. So thus, the renal oxygen extraction increased by 39 to 45%, indicating a renal oxygen supply demand mismatch during bypass, meaning when they sampled the renal venous blood, the extraction of oxygen was much higher because of the fact that what hemoglobin we were providing was not, not enough, so the extraction rate soared to 39 to 45%. Yeah, it's usually 25% is normal. Yeah, okay. During, so you're, yeah, you're 50 to almost uh, 85% uh, higher. After weaning from bypass, renal oxygenation was further impaired due to hemodilution and an increase in renal oxygen consumption. That's what they found. This was accompanied by a seven-fold increase in the NAG, the, the enzyme for tissue damage, to creatinine ratio. So now, there's a discussion section on this paper. I like to highlight some things, and they have two parts. But one part is the effects of bypass on our renal variables. Renal vascular resistance increased 15 to 23 percent with no change in renal blood flow. So even though the renal vascular resistance went up, the renal blood flow remained the same. But thus, as systemic perfusion flow increased, in other words, if we increased our flow, the relationship between renal blood flow and total perfusion flow, our, our pump flow, the renal blood flow to cardiac index ratio, they called it, decreased by 25 to 29%, such suggesting a redistribution of blood flow away from the kidneys during bypass. Hemodilution in combination with a maintained renal blood flow caused an 18 to 23% decrease in renal uh, delivery of oxygen. Glomerular filtration rate, filtration fraction, sodium filtration, sodium absorption, and urine flow were not affected by cardiopulmonary bypass. Renal oxygen consumption was not affected, while renal oxygen extraction increased 33 to 44% during bypass. So now, 11 of the 18 patients increased their serum creatinine one to two days postoperatively compared with their baseline creatinine. Four patients developed postoperative AKI, which is 22%, which is exactly what you said earlier, Joe. AKI ranges from 5 to 30%, depending on what paper you read, sometimes even higher than that. Uh, uh, so did they develop postoperative AKI, according, by, uh, by the way, according to the uh, kidney disease improving global outcomes, which uses the criteria there of acute uh, kidney injury network. Stages. Yeah, Cadigo. Cadigo, yeah. Okay. Um, now, look, they also discussed the effects of bypass on the release of that uh, enzyme, that injury tissue enzyme. The urinary NAG to creatinine ratio increased significantly 30 minutes after the start of bypass, with a seven fold increase 30 to 60 minutes after the end, after the end of bypass. 
The, the urinary nag to create creatinine ratio was normalized though 24 hours after bypass. Urinary nag creatinine correlated to the renal oxygen extraction. In other words, more oxygen extraction, higher nag production, basically indicating some type of correlation with injury. Now the conclusions were, the main findings were that despite a, a maintained systemic organ, a systemic oxygen delivery during bypass, the renal oxygen supply to demand relief was impaired, expressed as an increase in the renal oxygen extraction rate. The, the kidney was having to extract a far, far higher percentage of the ox oxygen from the blood that it was receiving because it felt as though it was not receiving enough delivery. Furthermore, renal oxygen oxygenation was even further deteriorated after the end of bypass. So there's some phenomena going on there. Finally, the significant positive correlation between NAG release and renal oxygen extraction during and after bypass suggests that renal hypoxia is the cause of, of the release of tubular injury markers and later the cause of postoperative AKI. The impaired renal oxygenation during bypass was caused by a decrease in renal oxygen delivery uh, due to hemodilution, they, they surmise, at a maintained level of the same renal uh, oxygen consu consumption. Yeah, John, that makes sense to me. You're flowing X and you have a hemoglobin of 14. And now you're flowing X minus whatever with a hemoglobin of 8. So Correct. the amount of blood flow may be a little bit diminished, which may lower the PO2 uh, or oxygen in the, in the medulla. But let's just say we keep the, the, the blood flow the same. The, the the, the kidney has to do the exact same amount of work because you're putting right. that much volume through it. But now it has a lot right. less oxygen. It has less oxygen because of hemodilution and generally our cardiac index is lower than what a normal uh, cardiac index would be because 2.4 is, is below our normal, what we actually have. And then um, there's this venal, uh, uh, renal vasoconstriction resistance increase mm -hmm. that also occurs. It's some unexplained shunting, which we really don't know where that's being shunted to because mm -hmm. as I explained in the anatomy and physiology part, there's one pathway of blood in and out of the kidney. So this shunting that they found, a little bit of a mis mystery. Somewhere mm -hmm. along the line it's happening. Conclusions also, the reduced uh, renal delivery of oxygen was mainly attributable to a reduced arterial oxygen content due to hemodilution as, as they said before. The renal blood flow remained unchanged despite an increase of more than 30% in the systemic perfusion flow rate during bypass. Uh, the bypass seemed to redistribute blood flow away from the kidneys as reflected by the fall in the renal blood flow to cardiac index ratio. One would have expected that the renal blood flow should have increased due to heat dilution induced decrease in blood viscosity it would have expected that and a well-maintained renal perfusion pressure during bypass. Now look at this. Uh, on the other hand, renal vascular resistance increased, which could be explained, by the way, we all know there's a neuroendocrine response to bypass, which is a release of norepi in our system, vasopressin, angiotensin II. So they're attributing a good, uh, a good surmise that probably this renal vascular resistance increase on pump is due to our neuroendocrine response that occurs once we go on pump. Now here's another paper by, same, by the same team, Joe. These guys really focus on this topic, did some good papers. Again, the same doctors, a different paper. This is an Annals of Thoracic Surgery 2019, impact of cardiac bone bypass on flow on renal oxygenation in patients undergoing cardiac operations. The purpose of this is to test the hypothesis that increased bypass flow rates might improve renal oxygenation, expressed as a reduced uh, renal oxygen delivery extraction rate. They conducted a, su a study on different aspects of bypass pump flow rates. They used a cardiac index flow of 2.4, then they went to 2.7, and they went to 3.0. On all patients during the pump run, they increased the flow for a period of time and took samples. Now, the sample of renal oxygen extraction rate and they sampled renal filtration fraction, which is something I'm not discussing too elaborate here. These flow rates were applied in a randomized sequence in each patient, meaning you might get 
2.4, then 3.0, then 2.7 on one patient, then you might get, so they randomly mix them up on all patients, and they just drew a, a numbers out of a hat to see how and what order they were going to do these flows. Renal vein catheter was used to measure the effects of the various pump flow rates on renal oxygen extraction rate and renal filtration fraction. So they had a renal vein catheter in also. Now they only, again, used 17 patients, which, you know, I wish these studies had a more powerful a cohort, but they did such an excellent job, and they found the results to be the same on every patient. That's what's interesting. But the 17 patients started off with the normal uh, creatinine levels and they underwent again normal thermic bypass to eliminate the hypothermia factors. They received a pulmonary artery and renal vein catheters again for measurements of systemic and renal variables, same as the previous study. Renal oxygen extraction, a direct measure of the renal oxygen delivery to renal oxygen consumption ratio, and again they measured renal filtration fraction were both all measured. Now, after the start of bypass and after the aortic was cross-clamped, the pump flow rate was randomly varied between 2.4, 2.7, and 3.0 cardiac index. Measurements were made after 10 minutes at each flow rate. They kept the flow at 10 minutes at those different rates, and then they did their samples. Bypass was initiated at 2.4 index on all patients, so they, initiated, they started off at that. Once things settled down and hemodynamically stable, they then began to adjust the flow rates of 2.7 and 3.0, were tested in all patients in a randomly determined order. Each pump flow rate level was maintained for 10 minutes, as I said. Blood samples were taken and a recording of the hemodynamic data was, was taken as well. Mean arterial pressure was allowed to vary only in between 60 and 80. They didn't run these high 110 pressures that some people think you have to have for AKI and good urine output. Infusions of norepi and nitroprusside were used as needed for blood pressure. You see they did not use neosinephrine or phenylephrine, right, Joe, which is very vasoconstrictive for the kidneys. We've discussed that in previous lectures here on this show. Renal oxygen extraction increased by 30% at a rate, a flow rate of 2.4 versus pre-bypass. At a flow rate of 2.7, renal extraction reduced itself by 12%. It was a lower, uh, and at 3.0 cardiac index, renal oxygen extraction was 23% less. So you're seeing an, uh, an, uh, an effect of the higher flow. This corresponds to a a 14% improvement at 2.7 and, and a 30% improvement at 3.0 of the renal oxygen supply demand relationship. So by increasing these flows, they did have an improvement in the, uh, in the perfusion of the kidney. In the, ex right, in the, ex as, as indicated by reduced extraction rate. So right. instead of being 48% well, extraction, they were closer to 35% extraction or lower. Right. Exactly. So you're showing that you're having a, some positive effect, right? You're yes. delivering more. It's a positive you're effect, right. More. Agreed. Go ahead, Dave. Filtration fraction was not affected by changes in flow rate. I didn't mention what that was, but uh, indicated that, that number, if you understand it, indicates that GFR rate increased in proportion to the increased renal perfusion, which I mentioned in the anatomy and physiology section. Now, in the discussion part, renal tissue oxygenation depends on the balance between renal oxygen consumption and renal oxygen delivery. It depends on the balance of the two. Studies have shown that renal oxygen consumption depends on renal blood flow and that changes in renal blood flow and oxygen delivery will cause correspondent changes in oxygen consumption as we've been repeating before. Thus, an increase in renal blood flow will increase the GFR rate and the fil filtered amount of sodium, which in turn will increase the tubular sodium load and consequently Consequently, the renal oxygen consumption that I've also said earlier. They repeat this in this paper. Now, let's look at this show. Their data indicated that a map of 60 to 80, that at a map of 60 to 80 during the entire bypass run of these patients, changes in bypass flow might have a bigger effect on renal oxygenation than changes in the perfusion pressure. Yeah, I mean, I believe we that. We have this argument all the time. Yeah. Right. Now, they have a discussion to talk about something. Okay, this study does have some limitations worth talking about. They, they admit there's some limitations here. Most notably, the actual renal blood flow itself was not measured. The uh, renal oxygen consumption, therefore, could not be actually obsessed directly. The fall in renal oxygen extraction rate at increasing bypass flow rates could suggest 
that the renal oxygen consumption is decreased. Or if it is unchanged or increased, it is surpassed by a greater increase in the renal oxygen delivery. It is also unclear whether the beneficial effect of a higher bypass flow on renal oxygen oxygenation is sustained beyond the 10 minute period. Meaning, if you were to leave it at these higher flows, maybe there's some type of auto regulation uh, that would kick in that would then make this not effective after 30 minutes or something like that. They don't know the answer to that because they only did it for 10 minutes. Um, go ahead. No information from the study was gathered whether high bypass flow rates are beneficial in terms of reducing the renal outcome or AKI. They did not. They did not measure that. Mm -hmm. Now, this last study. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, yeah. John, this John, last I would, study, I'm sorry, John. Forgive me, but just because I have a couple of things that I need to bring up. But uh, remind me about the temperature, okay? Number one. Uh, but I've got it written down too. I have a good question from online, one of our online viewers. Um, but it would have okay. been nice in that previous study if they would have measured DO2, reported DO2, versus just CPB blood flow. I mean, I, I realize mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that blood flow, the amount of flow, maybe, maybe what they're saying is that a map of 60 to 80, the increased flow, you, don't, you have a little bit higher map and you need less uh, vasopressors, whether you're using norepi or using whatever you want to use. I, I don't know, but it would have been nice to have known the DO2, I think. Yeah, yeah, because you're not talking about what the hematocrit level was and whatnot, right? Right. So, you know, it actually is good because it's showing you that if you blindly increase the flow, of course, your delivery improves, but at the same time, you know, you, you don't know if your actual outcome is going to be better for the kidney or not. It appears as though higher flow, higher delivery of oxygen in this case too, is not somewhat of a, a, a benefit, although, um, you know, more significant than increasing pressure. Because if you just increase the pressure, you may just be vasoconstricted. Now, on this study, it comes out of uh, Korea, Dr. Song and his uh, colleagues did, I think, a, a great study where they really looked at urine output during bypass predicts acute kidney injury after surgery. And this is in May, in Medicine Magazine, a journal, a Medicine Journal, May 2016. And they did a two-year retrospective study, 696 patients though. So the other two were low volume. So I, I found one here that really looked at urine output and took a high number of uh, cohort. And they investigated the optimal amount of urine output during bypass and the incidence of AKI performed logistic regression analysis to find potential predictors of AKI. They did a lot of uh, analysis on this. They did nomograms for estimating the probability of AKI developing uh, for different urine outputs were drawn and validated. I'm not going to go through all those, but I'm just letting you know they did a pretty detailed statistical analysis of things. It's a retrospective. Of the 696 patients analyzed, 257, 37% uh, had AKI. That's high. In their particular, yeah. The amount of bypass urine showed a biphasic association with the incidence of AKI. I'm going to show you what they mean by that. After dividing the patients by four milliliters per kilogram per hour of bypass urine output, some above that level and some below that level, they did find a predictive model for AKI, which actually showed pretty excellent consistency. Four milliliters per kilogram per hour. That's Renal a lot, too. Pretty high. Renal hypoperfusion is the main factor precipitating acute renal failure after cardiac surgery, and urine flow by a lot of our colleagues and us often is used as an indicator of renal perfusion during bypass. They're basically making that comment of the present state of the field. In theory, poor urine output during bypass deserves to become an early indicator of renal injury. So just setting the stage here of why they did this study. No previous studies, to their knowledge, when they did this in 2016, where the investigators, uh, no previous studies in, in investigating the predictors of AKI has reported urine output in its significance of what it really means. So they really endeavored to do something that they felt 
wasn't in the literature very much. In addition to oliguria, polyuria beyond a certain amount must be suspected to be abnormal because tubular damage during bypass can lead to the loss of urinary concentrating capacity, meaning you're dumping a lot of urine out and it's not reabsorbing, like I was explaining, needs to be done. They plotted the probability of AKI occurrence in relation to the amount of bypass urine output. They observed that there was a biphasic relationship between them, as I mentioned. They were inversely proportional when the amount of uh, bypass urine was below four milliliters per kilogram per hour. Uh, it was bad. Um, the probability remained constantly low, and AKI was not reduced further when the amount was over four milliliters per kilogram per hour. In other words, if you reached four and you kept going higher and higher, you didn't do the patient any 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 good by by just keeping higher urine outputs once you reach this seemingly cutoff point. Bypass urine was identified as a predictor in both models, both below four milliliters per kilogram per hour and greater than four. In the group with the bypass urine output less than four, the odds ratio for AKI increased by 233% with every one milliliter kilogram per hour decrease in urine output. You had a, odds of high, that much higher odds of having AKI. In patients with bypass urine greater than four, the odds ratio for AKI increased by 11% with every one milliliter per kilogram per hour increase in urine output that you went over four. So here's the graphic of the thing from, the, uh, from their uh, publication. You see there, right at four, patients with bypass urine less than four, the odds, uh, you can see how your, your probability of AKI is very high there on the left, and it comes straight down until you get to four, and then it pretty much levels off. It's pretty hard to see on this slide, but as you get above four, there is an 11% increase of AKI incidence for every one milliliter above that, five milliliter per kilogram per hour, six, and so on. So they seem to think four was a pretty magic number. Um, so the, the last one there, the bottom one I'm on now, this finding underscores the need. No, no, go ahead, go back. This was just an insertion. I was already mentioned the top three. So this finding underscores the need to carefully evaluate decreased concentrating capacity resulting from tubular damage when faced with excessive diuresis, with an indication of the kidney being out of control and not reabsorbing correctly. In the latter subgroup, preoperative use of diuretic agents was identified as another independent risk factor of AKI. So if you're giving your patient diuretics on your pump and whatever else to think that you're going to have a wonderful urine output, that you're showing, oh, this is great because we have great urine output on pump. I did a great job. Just giving uh, diuretics, uh, diuretics itself does increase the, the likelihood of AKI. All right, so this episode's Gem of the Week. We're in the home stretch here, Joe. I think you're going to love this one. U.S. Army creates device to keep a soldier's hands warm, even in freezing weather, eliminating the need for gloves. The United States Army has developed a high-tech solution that will keep a soldier's extremities warm without gloves while allow allowing them the full dexterity of their hands. Gloves themselves can decrease dexterity by 50 to 70%. The project has been in the works for 80 years as soldiers have struggled with sacrificing warmth for function by using gloves to use their weapons. It's a solution that would, ab that would enable a person to have warm hands, even if barehanded in the freezing cold so that dexterity could be maintained, said John Castellani, one of the major researchers of the, in the U.S. Army. In cold environments, the body reduces blood flow to the periphery, as we all know. Hands and feet see less blood flow, and therefore skin temperature greatly decreases. Gloves for everyday person might mean they can't use their cell phone correctly, but in a soldier's hands, it may mean life or death if they can't operate their weapon correctly. The personal heating dexterity device allows a person's hands and fingers to stay warm in cold weather, eliminating the need for gloves and preventing the loss of hand function in the cold. Now all this is, and they don't tell you the technology here, but this is some type of device, they call it the PHD2. The purpose of the PHD2 is to increase hand and finger temperature by providing external heat to the user's forearms. Now they say heat, this is not a heating pad, this is some type of very unusual technology because there's no electricity hooked to this or battery to provide the uh, warming agent. Uh, this uh, heating force, whatever it is, is then absorbed 
into your system and raises the temperature of your hands and fingers. And you can see kind of a picture of it there on someone's arm. Okay, yeah, I think that's the end, guys. Thanks for listening. And uh, go ahead. You see um, uh, that we have a discussion period next of uh, very, the two very topics. excellent. Yeah, absolutely. The, so uh, a question and output and also the heat dexterity for the army. Two topics of the day. And one more. So, um, so a question. Yeah, they could use that in Ukraine. It's pretty cold over there. Um, Imagine and, how cold it must be to hold on to a piece of uh, metal, Joe. You were a you have experience with in living in New York and then being a, a former police officer, right? What did you well, think I was about? In, I was in California. I was in California, Southern. Oh, I thought you were in California. New York. No, I. Well, I, you I, weren't I, in cold weather at all then. <laughs> no, it got cold every once in a while, but never that cold. Um, oh, I thought you were in New York. Okay. No, God forbid. So anyway, um, <laughs> no, I was in the land of fruits and nuts, California. So uh, so okay. so. Uh, uh, of course, talk about, if you will, uh, the question we have from uh, Modima is on uh, how does reducing core temperature affect, of course, all that's going on. And we noticed in your studies the, that you reviewed, they used uh, normothermic cardiopulmonary bypass. I'm assuming that means 37 degrees, 37.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's what it meant. Um, but of course, we do kidney transplants right you take a kidney out and of course at that point in time it has no blood flow you put it on ice in a cooler um so you cool it so that the structural tissue uh has a reduced oxygen requirement but it is doing no work so there's no that you're really reducing consumption so you have these two aspects to it which i completely understand you have the functional structure the structural aspect of the tissue that needs blood flow and then you have the the functional part that does the work that requires its own oxygenation because it's doing all of this work so there's a lot of things going on there that make the i i just think the the kidney is a fascinating organ but how does hypothermia during cardiopulmonary bypass affect this what what can you uh, explain about well, that as as uh, as you you might uh, you, you you might know well, Joe. Uh, anytime you do hypothermia, it's going to have uh, a number of effects. But number one is vasoconstrictive, especially to the periphery. Right? Uh, hypothermia is going to have a massive vasoconstrictive effect. And the question is how widespread, and how long, and to what extent uh, is it going to have uh, beyond the periphery? You're going to have vasoconstrictive effects. Do you have it in the uh, gut? Do you have it in the in the in the renal and uh, perfusion and so on? So uh, I think hypothermia for general cardiac surgery has gotten to where we think hypothermia is cooling the patient to 35 degrees. You know that that was unheard of some years back. We would cool patients always to 28 or 30, right? Thinking yeah, that absolutely. we were preserving, thinking that we were reducing the oxygen demands of the tissue, and therefore we had a safety margin if our perfusion were to drop off. Uh, right. So number one, it's vasoconstrictive, but then when you rewarm the patient, you have a whole nother litany of problems because the rewarming process now, you could have reperfusion injury of the vasoconstrictive areas, and you could also have uh, inflammatory responses, which you do have when you mm -hmm. rewarm people from a cold temperature. Mm -hmm. And yeah, underneath those three things I just mentioned, the vasoconstrictive, reduced perfusion, the reperfusion injury, and the inflammatory response, you could take a, a whole semester course on studying what happens when you do those three things to to the patient. So, mm -hmm. you know, many papers that our, our caller could, uh, mm -hmm. could probably Google up or something and see. Sure. And I think, too, it's important for us to express that um, AKI does not mean long-term renal failure um, or mm -hmm. end-stage renal disease. AK AKI is measured by a, this bump in creatinine, may have no clinical uh, significance at all, uh, but it occurs and it goes, it gets listed as AKI, uh, but there's no clinical uh, sequelae that, 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 is, uh, that is manifested, you know, for the patient. They go home and they do just fine. You know, we do uh, type 1 dissections under profound hypothermic circulatory arrest, uh, you know, retrograde or selective cerebral perfusion, integrated retrograde, whatever you want to do. Um, 
tomorrow I'm going to be talking a little bit about the cases that I do with uh, translating this into ultrafiltration, Z buff, and various other ways of, of managing either uh, acid base or electrolyte metabolite uh, balance and also uh, fluid balance and what we do to patients where we are doing 25 plus liters of, uh, of uh, Z buff in a really compressed period of time, about an hour. And uh, of the cases that I've done with that technique, over 100, um, none of those patients, not one of those patients has developed uh, any type of uh, AKI or long-term uh, renal complication associated to the surgery. So, you know, although AKI rates are very high, actual renal failure rates mm -hmm. requiring dialysis, whether short-term or long-term, is actually a lot lower than that. So I think that's important to point out. What would you say it is, about 2% or so, that people after a bypass case well with routine cabbages involved it's got to be pretty pretty it's pretty low i would think i think for Maybe routine cabbage that. very low probably around two percent i think for um, you know, maybe maybe one to two percent. I think with uh, valves, of course, they're always going to be more problematic for a variety of reasons and a variety of causes. But it's about five to seven percent is is what I understand the data to be. It's probably a lot higher with your aortic complicated aortic. It procedures, is. I would think. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but again, you know, I've done a lot of type one dissections, and those people have done very well. Some don't, you know, yeah. but I mean, by and large. Uh, they survive the operation, they go to the ICU, they recover, and, and they go home not on dialysis. So, um, yeah. you know, it's surprising to me. And uh, I, I think that, you know, I, I don't actually think we know. We, that we know a lot, but we, but we don't really know. So there's the, 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 the uh, Don Rumsfeld, you know, series of knowns. There's, there's, yeah. there's the things we know we know, the things we know we don't know, and the things we don't know we don't know. And of course, that all is right. Yeah. And all of that is coming out over time, I think. And maybe one of these millennia, we will actually understand this. Uh, but uh, very good. It was an excellent review. Tomorrow, my 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 review is going to be again more on I'm going to I'm, I'm going to spend, I think, one or two slides on on the kidney i might steal a couple of yours and uh uh, uh and then really i'm going to be talking more about ultrafiltration and it's known published effect uh whether it be ultrafiltration for fluid management or whether it be z buff for whatever else you're doing homeostasis neutrality um uh how that affects or what the data says how that affects renal function well as you saw from my exhaustive list of uh, aki risk factors hemofiltration was not on there <laughs> yeah so interesting I, yeah i did I notice would, that very yeah. good point very 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 good point mm -hmm. okay but i guess you have you know there's some controversy to all all topics so we interested i'll be excited to, to watch i'll be uh off work tomorrow and i will be tuning in hopefully maybe i'll even call in That'd be great. Yeah, if you want to jump in, that'd be fantastic. I would love that very much. In fact, Ramsh is going to join me. Um, there's another fella, uh, Berto from UT down in the medical center who uh, is going to try. And uh, Ann Greco is going to try, or Grecho. You know, she's the new uh, president of the ABCP. I don't know if you knew that or not. I think she oh, deserves nice. a congrats. I hope she can join us. So, uh, of course, you know, we do these programs in the middle of the week and early in the morning at 8 o'clock. It's, you know, it's always interfered with, uh, with um, uh, uh, the surgery schedule. And I'm really trying to figure out, John, which is the best approach. We had a meeting about this yesterday, uh, and we're trying to figure, you know, I've done, I've done, I've run the gamut, right? I've done long weekend programs. I've done, you know, uh, programs that were multiple presentations at different days of the week. And now I'm doing, you're welcome, Medima. Um, and uh, John Medima sends her thank you, her gratitude for, uh, to us. Um, 
I've done the uh, now this latest iteration where we do short one hour sessions, you know, three days a week or four days a week, a couple of times a month, trying to develop new programs, new shows, you know, similar to yours. You have Tammy Spears, Spires Center Journal Club. We have the Knowledge Nuggets. We have the Vanderbilt Forum. I'm trying to continue to grow that. But I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know which works best. The the conference style where you have a lot at one time or the sort of snippets, if you will, um, uh, uh, vignettes, however you want to couch it, uh, where we do just a quick one hour a day and, and get through it. And I, 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 I haven't scheduled anything past this latest one because I'm working on trying to figure out what is the best way to do this. Well, the great news is that all of these are free and all of these are recorded and logged on your on your site and people can come and pick now. I don't know how many presentations must now be cataloged on your site, Joe. Is it is it over 100 yet? It's it's I don't know. I'll, I'll, find, I'll, I'll find out in a minute. It, we've been it's, doing this for quite a while and there's just, quite a quite a few. Yeah, just so you know, it's it's approaching 300. Okay, yeah, I was going to say because I think I've been involved in 30 or 40 myself. <laughs> At least, probably more than that. Uh, but probably. it's been a uh, it's been a very it's been very rewarding. I've I've enjoyed it a lot. I've enjoyed the uh, the uh, collegiality that uh, I've had with you and with Matt and with Tammy. Ramsh is going to be here tomorrow. Mike Brown, of course. Min comes in and has been here before. Sharon. Uh, when you look at our our uh, you know Dr. Samir when he was coming, uh, 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 Dr. Matoyer, of course, Dr. Duval. Um, you know, just a Dr. Safi, we've really, Dr. Badia, don't want to leave anybody out. You know, you go through the list of, uh, of the folks that we've had and it's really impressive. Um, but yeah. you know, we have to keep it going and you always have to be innovating and you have to be trying to change things till you find the right sequence that really works. Um, and so anybody yeah, out I there has any ideas of what timing how to do these works best for everyone let me know well you know joe i mean i, I think when we used to do the half a day four four or five hour things uh, my guess would be that people to watch all of it would have had to have allotted a half a day to to the show where the snippets were an hour probably people could jump in and jump out for that hour and um and, and catch it uh, a little easier than a four hour block if they're busy but at the same time um I think mixing up the times and doing it all different times is going to accommodate the most people because people's schedules are always changing. You're always on call. Mm -hmm. Different days are off. Different days are working and travelers and whatnot, you know, like I do. And um, I never really know when it's going to be a good time for me. I, I couldn't tell you. So, I mean, the mix gives me a, a good chance that I might hit hit them uh, on a good time. But it, it's hit mm -hmm. or miss, I think, probably with everybody to some extent, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if it's a short show like this, you could watch it while they're taking the memory down. There's some guys that take at least an hour to do it. Not everybody, but <laughs> some, some, you know, um, and uh, and uh, it's, you know, we'll figure it out. So we'll see. So look at our website because I'll be developing our next presentations and you'll see what we've decided. So at, uh, that'll be coming up in the next day or so. So it won't be very long. All and right. So, um the guys, if you want to reach out to me, remember it's john.ingram at perfweb.us. You can send me an email, comments, questions, suggestions for future show. I would love to see that. And I do answer all my emails uh, as thoroughly as possible and as quickly as possible. So feel free to email me and let's strike up a conversation. I can always learn something from you. Perfect. Thank you so much, John. Good seeing you, everybody out there in web world. Thank you all for joining in. Madima, thank you so much for your excellent uh, participation and questions. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow morning. I got my eight o'clock uh, program to do. So I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Yeah. I'll be there. I'll be there.